Over the course of any campaign, you're going to come up against a wide range of other legendary lords. If you manage to beat them in battle, not only will you take out a rival and give yourself an edge in your campaign, you'll also earn the lord that defeats them a special trait to keep with them for the rest of the game. But not all of these are created equal, so today let's count down the top 10 legendary lord defeat traits so you know who to hunt down in your next campaign. But first, I want to tell you all about how you can stay hydrated with channel partner Holy faster than a flame cannon can take out some zombies. So by now you've probably heard of Holy and their line of energy drinks, but did you know that they also have a whole line of drinks powders focused entirely on hydration? Holy Hydration is the healthy way to stay in tip top condition, whether you're at the gym working out or working out how to beat that gym in Pokemon. Staying hydrated is important no matter what you're doing and making it taste good is a great way to make it easy to stay on top of. Holy has three flavors of hydration drinks and while all taste great, my favorite is strawberry kiwi for an authentically fruity flavor. No matter what you choose, you're getting a healthy alternative to traditional sports drinks with no sugar, no caffeine, natural flavors and colors, and a mix of electrolytes to keep you feeling great no matter what. And all of this for only 20 calories and 80 pence per serving. So check out Holy Hydration using the link in the description and use code Colonel5 for five pounds off your first order or code Colonel for 10% off any order store wide. One last thank you to Holy for partnering with the channel. And now let's see how that flame cannon's getting on. Whoa, I love the smell of burnt undead in the morning. Now, onto the list. Kicking off the list, we have Ikit Claw. He is by far one of the strongest lords in the entire game, so it only makes sense that you'd have a matching reward when you manage to take him down. So, once he's beaten, your lord's army will gain an extra 10 wins of magic reserve capacity, and the faction will gain 10% to their research speed. The magic first, now yeah, it might not be super exciting or glamorous, but an extra 10 wins of magic in reserve is another cast or two, and if a battle comes down to the wire, that can mean the difference between victory and defeat. Now yes, it's only capacity, so you'll still need to actually fill that capacity using stances in areas of high magic, but once it's filled, you can use it in battles to rain magical support wherever it's needed. The research is, again, not super exciting or glamorous, but that doesn't make it any less useful. Research trees are a key part of pretty much every faction, and most of them offer some pretty great buffs to every area of the campaign. Getting a 10% boost to that speed will never not be welcome. The earlier you get this one, the better, since you'll have more text to chase after, but this extra speed can get you extra cash, stats, relations, and anything else in the game, depending on what faction you're playing as. While this trait may not be as crazy overpowered as the Lord himself, it's still a pretty great reward for taking him down, and is very on theme, so it's a great place to start this list. Sticking with the magical theme with one of the most recent lords to join the Warhammer 3 family. Taking down Yuan Bo gets you one reward for just that army, but even so, this is a pretty top tier reward, especially if you can play around it. 20% cost reduction for all spells is pretty crazy, and if you stack this armor with a bunch of casters to make the most of it, you're increasing your potential by a massive amount. Whether you're using that 20% to cast the most expensive spells in the game for a much reduced cost, or making cheap spells even cheaper so you can spam them to your heart's content for all those sweet passive bonuses, this is a great trait to pick up. It may be simple, but sometimes simplicity is a good thing, and that absolutely is the case here. If you somehow manage to take down the Jade Dragon, make sure you get recruiting casters and shipping them first class to your army for literal free magic. Next up, we have a bit of a strange entry coming from the Lizard Prophet to Henoween. Extra casualties captured post battle is going to be a lot more useful for some factions than others, but overall it's going to bring you a lot of value if you're doing a lot of fighting, which, well, the game isn't called Total Peace Tranquility Mallet 3, is it? For factions like the Dark Elves who have his slaves, this will be a great pickup, but even for everyone else, more captives means those post battle options just get better. If you're replenishing your own army, enjoy a nice boost to your healing to get back in the fight sooner. If you're ransoming them off for cash, then enjoy more in your pockets after each battle. It's another one of those that will kind of go under the radar, but over the course of the rest of your campaign, it will add up to a whole lot of value. As for the attrition, again, it's going to depend on who you're playing as and where you're going, but a flat reduction taking out a quarter of all attrition is pretty top notch. It doesn't matter if you're out to sea, spending 40 days and 40 nights crossing the desert, or just marching in some chaos. You'll be taking a lot less damage per turn and get to battles at a much higher level of HP than you would otherwise. Attrition is one of those things that can sneak up on you if you don't pay enough attention. With this trait, you can rest just a little bit easier when you're making your journey across some hazardous territory. Is it out of this world impactful and going to change the way you play? Not really, but it offers some nice boost to give you a little tailwind on your campaign, so that's still pretty good for a little trait. Moving now to something for your actual army from Baldmar the Beautiful, an extra 3 attack and defense. Try not to freak out from these massive game-breaking stat buffs, I assure you, your units will not explode into a supernova from carrying these massive stat boosts. In all seriousness, 3 might not seem like a lot, but this will be on top of any stat boosts from skills, XP and anything else you have in your army. It's not going to make every battle into a cakewalk, but it will give you just a small edge in combat to deal just a little bit more damage and take just a little bit less. This is another one where the earlier you get it, the more you'll feel its impact since 3 extra melee stats will affect units with 20 attack more than those with 50. Still, whenever you get it, it's going to give your units just one more edge. If they somehow manage to come up against a doppelganger army with the exact same elite units, yours will come out on top. All because you decide to bully Mr. Clean off the map first. 
Continuing the streak of me getting my vampire counts onto as many of these top 10s as I can, and this time, I've even got my Domi Mommy herself. Now, if by some miracle you manage to beat Isabella in battle before succumbing to a metal thigh high related charms, you'll earn your lord passive regeneration. Now, obviously, the amount this value brings is going to depend on what lord you use to beat her, since a backline's mage who avoids all damage might as well not bother, but a tanky frontline's battler is going to be taken to the next level. If you get it on the right lord, then regeneration is a crazy powerful effect to have. At all times in battle, no matter what's going on, their HP will be climbing back towards full. Of course, it is quite slow and there is a cap, but most of the time that's nearly an entire second health bar, meaning enemies are going to have to face taking out your lord two entire times, increasing the challenge significantly. Regen is normally balanced out with some downside like the vampires being undead and crumbling, but here if your lord loses leadership, they'll just run away and once they regain some confidence, be at a safe distance to get it all back for round two. It may only be a little bit per second, but it's a bit more than nothing and quickly adds up to a lot if you take regular breaks. Besides, what lord basically gives you their gimmick when you beat them? After battling your way through all the plagues and poison, the battle for taking out Festus better be worth it and I'm happy to say, it kinda is. So we have replenishment and vigor loss reduction and no prizes for guessing what the best part is here. Replenishment just means armies can get back to fighting quicker without the risk of losing units or the army itself. So you really can't ever have enough of it, especially later into the game. It's only 5% so nothing crazy, but still, it means 5% more healing per turn and can be the difference between fighting every turn and every two turns, which adds up over the course of a game. Vigor loss is a little less exciting but also useful in some circumstances. If you somehow end up in a longer battle than usual, then you can rest easy knowing your troops will be performing at the top of their game for a lot longer than the enemy. The more tired units get, the worse they perform, so delaying that drop off for as long as possible won't ever be a bad thing. You can't hate on how well this trait suits Festus. You heal faster and get tired slower. I'd expect nothing else from the performance enhancer of the Warriors of Chaos. Sticking with the Warriors of Chaos, we have Bellacor. He acts as a kind of final boss in the Realms of Chaos campaign, and defeating him in Immortal Empires still carries some of this weight, especially once you see how much they cram into just one trait. It is a little bit like going to the buffet and grabbing just a little bit of everything, so let's take it line by line. Extra Winds of Magic capacity is great, as we covered earlier. Yeah, you have to fill it up, but once you do, that's an extra spell at least, so nothing to complain about there. Increased control locally is kind of mid to be honest, but when you're taking promises every turn, rebellions can come in thick and fast, so just having a little something to help keep a lid on things won't ever be bad. More casualty replenishment is pretty top tier, getting armies back into fighting form is all that really stops you from constantly battling every single turn, so being able to speed that process up just a little bit is welcome in any campaign. And lastly, weapon strength. Whilst most would argue that weapon strength is kind of redundant since most armies rely on missiles for endgame damage, I would argue that more damage of any kind isn't a bad thing. If you are using defensive front lines, they don't lose any of that defensive power and just get a little bit more damage, so why not? Individually, none of these are great, but quite like combining me, Isabella, a gallon of Lubiderm, and a waterproof mattress, when everything comes together, you end up with something special. It just makes your army better at almost every aspect of being an army, so what's not to love? Coming to third place now and sticking with regeneration, and this time we're pairing it with something a little more offensive focused, what else would you expect from the Twilight Twins? So first off, let's talk about missile strength. It's only for your lord, so make sure to try and beat them with someone that can make use of this as rare as they may be. Look, I'm not going to lie to you and say that this is the best part because it's really not. If you have a missile lord that can make use of it, then 10% is a nice boost. If you don't, you're not really missing out on all that much. As for the other part, we've already talked about how great replenishment is, and that was when we were talking 5%. Now, four times that for a massive 20%, and it's honestly pretty crazy just how strong this is. There's not really any other way I can explain it other than your armies are just going to be super healthy pretty much after every battle, especially if you can stack this with some other effects. The only thing that holds you back from constant battling is healing, and this speeds that up a ridiculous amount, so it's incredibly useful. Nothing more that I haven't said already, so I'll leave it at that. Coming in second place, of course the Chaos Dwarves had to make it somewhere into this list, but instead of playing as them, this is fighting against them. So 15% missile resist is a... Uh, it's fine, I guess. Flatly ignoring nearly a fifth of all missiles fired at you is pretty nice, especially against those more powerful missile units, but we all know that the cash money is the real winner here. 10% from all settlement buildings on the entire map whenever this lord is alive and on the game map. So you could have a hundred settlements each at max size bringing in piles of gold per turn and then just give yourself another 10% on top of it. Early on that 10% might not seem like much but once you have a few settlements under your belt it adds up fast and will send your economy snowballing to absurdity. More gold means more armies, faster building, easier greasing of diplomatic wheels and just about everything else in the game. More money never means more problems in Warhammer 3 so having a bit extra from every settlement is never going to be a bad thing. And sticking with gold for our number one spot, we have Greasus Goldtooth. Hey, at least the Ogres have something going for him. Beating them is at least worth a reward if you get to the Overtyrant himself. Now a bit of preface, this trait is the best in the game if you can make use of it, and I'm mainly talking about the trading. Since I feel like most factions, especially those close to Greasus, can make use of good trading, I'm still going to give it the top spot, but if you're playing as Grimgore, this would be essentially useless. Anyway, onto the effect, starting with the worst one. 
building income. Don't get me wrong, 20% extra income from all local buildings can be pretty great if you have your lords standing in your most profitable regions all game long, but chances are they're out on the front lines and standing in newly established provinces where that 20% will be about 5 extra gold if that. If you can somehow manage to use a lord to beat Greasers and then have them stood back home by all means, go for it, but chances are you won't get too much out of this one. Trade tariffs, however, are faction-wide and normally only get better as the game goes on. If you can pick up plenty of trade resources and build a pay collection of trade partners, an extra 10% can be thousands, if not tens of thousands of gold per turn. As we just covered, that will come in incredibly useful no matter what you decide to use it for. Trading already is one of the best ways to make passive money in the entire game, so boosting that will never be a bad thing. Like I said, it is going to depend on your faction, but if you're Cafe, Chaos Dwarves or anyone else that can become a trade powerhouse, you're going to have a huge boost to that passive income once you take down the trade lord. And that's our list. Did I miss any trace you think should have made it? Let me know in the comments below. Like, subscribe, and if you want more Warmer 3 Top 10s, then check out this video here on the Top 10 Heroes in the Game.